Okay, so the question that we asked last week, um, which, you know, if you guys remember, I'm sorry, it wasn't last week, it was two weeks ago, which, um, if, if you guys kind of remember about it, we all kind of discussed it, it was that if you do, just do fun or didn't know that it was wrong, is the horoscope really bad? And we all had a discussion about that with really two main themes coming out. Um, some people said, absolutely no, uh, don't even look at it, and some people said it's okay as long as um, you don't... It's okay as long as you don't believe in it, or as long as you don't do it like I think through saying religiously. Yeah. What? Take it to vote. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And that was really I I think it, correct me if I'm wrong, but that was really where you, the, the two the two dividing camps yes. on that one, right? Okay. Cool. Um. So we're just gonna look at a few other things, and then I will come back to that and give my view on it. Um. With the whole uh uh horse grip thing. Um. But another thing that's kind of popular in the cult is materialization. Um, this is, uh, you know, we looked at it last uh, two weeks ago, and I, I want to just kind of come back on it. Materialization is where someone supposedly appears in a seance. And we talked about how normally people think that it's something like a, um, a dead ancestor or a friend or something like that. But then we showed how um, it, was, uh, it was a demon who takes on the form of a person for a limited time um, and then always goes back. Now, I, I wanted to come back to it this week because I really wanted to distinguish what's happening from, from uh, what God does in the Bible. In a resurrection, the person doesn't appear to be back, like ethereal, you know what I mean, where they're not, like uh, on the movie Ghost from the 90s. You know, it, it, it's not like that. A resurrection is where someone physically rises from the dead, like Jesus or Lazarus, where they were dead and then they came back to life. Um, but in a materialization, it's um, someone, a, a dead person appearing, and it's usually at something like a seance. I mean, these people don't just appear out of thin air. Um, so then that brings up the question, well, what about when Samuel was raised back to, the, back to life at that seance? And um, there's a few things. Um, that, well, before we get to that, um, it, it raises up the question, does, did God send Samuel in spirit, or was he a ghost, or how, how, would, how did that work? Because he wasn't physically resurrected. He was only there for a limited time. And for this, it's important to not get too carried away here, so I'm going to try and, and, and not say more than the Bible itself says, okay? How do I want to say that? Um, okay, so on that seance, the, the witch, and we talked about this two weeks ago, the witch was not expecting... For Samuel to actually show up, she was expecting for the for the demon to show up like regular. But when she saw that it was actually Samuel, it says that she cried out because she was she was struck with fear because it was actually Samuel. So we know beyond a doubt it was not a demon in this case; it was Samuel. But we also know that he wasn't physically raised from the dead, and he did go back into it. It says he came out as though from the from the ground. So it seems like God. I don't know exactly how, how to reconcile this because it seems like God did materialize Samuel, right. even though that wasn't supposed – like God doesn't work through seances. So right. we have a little bit of a conundrum, God doing something that we don't expect him to do. Right. But with that being said, there's a lot of cases like this in the Old Testament where God does things that make us feel uncomfortable. You know, So it's important during those times to realize that God is in control, that he told us not to do these kinds of things. Right. But for whatever reason – he utilized something that – because it says very specifically God was not speaking to Saul even though he was trying all these different methods. He still was not speaking to Saul. And so then after trying all these different things, Saul finally just went to a witch and tried to get her to, her to do, a, a answer. And so I think it's, it's very important to look at it in that backdrop. This is, it's the only instance of this kind of thing happening. And in all the, the rest of the law, it says very specifically, do not consult witches. Do not – do not do all these practices. So I think, you know, things should be seen in that light. Now, why God used the seance, um, I guess I have no idea. <laughs> that's, that's just something, you know, you got to be realize that, that the Bible doesn't clarify why that happened. So it's like, like you, you got to kind of... What do you mean? Correcting soul... Well, you see, I guess that's possible, but at the same time, he very clearly says, just as I told you before, 
This is God taking the kingdom away from you, and you are going to go into battle, and you are going to die. Or maybe just so, using that kind of example, the reason why not. Oh, like to to the witch, or for us, or for, for us. Oh, okay, I see what you're saying. To do that. Maybe. I mean, it, it really doesn't doesn't say. Um, so, anyways, that takes us to where we left off last week, the poltergeist. Now, a poltergeist is basically like you see on the movies where, uh, you know, um, a house is haunted or, uh, you know, a ghost appears. There's different things like that. Um, if you've seen the horror movies, it's all kind of the same idea, just in different, uh, you know, different, slightly tweaked, I guess, details, I should say. Um, but a, uh, what a poltergeist really is is a demonic interaction with a house or with an object or with people, Okay. Um, it is not a it is not a dead person because we know the Bible says very clearly that when a person dies, you know they go to a certain place. They don't just roam around the world. Excuse me. And so uh, with poltergeists, we have to realize even they've been televised and stuff like that. You know, with, with, with hauntings, things can't really be haunted. Okay, there can be some items that are in a sense dedicated to evil purposes, like. Um, we talked about the Ouija boards, for instance, or you know, um, objects or charms, things that, that can be dedicated to that. But we really don't see some uh, demons as being able to take con—I shouldn't say take control, but take dominion over things in the world. They're not just like staking claims on stuff. You know what I mean? And so when when we're looking at poltergeist, remember that the, a demon will present itself in whichever way you want it to. If you want, if you believe that it's your dead ancestors, ancestor, they're going to show up like that. If you think that you know ghosts or whatever, if you think that hauntings, well, then it's going to show up in whatever way to get your attention on them rather than on God, and to get um, to. Because remember, demons don't really care what you believe. They'll they're, they're flexible to whatever you whatever you want them to appear as. Um, so it's not ghosts, not souls stuck in limbo. Um, when you're looking at these things, it, it becomes very important to look at what the Bible says. You know, because the Hollywood has a lot of different ideas on, on, on these things. Um, astral projection is another thing. Now, if you've seen... Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I thought there were more. If you've seen um, a lot of, really, a lot of uh, children's shows or movies, um, some examples of children's shows, um, Avatar, The Last Airbender, um, Adventure Time, you're familiar with the idea of astral projection. And the idea is that your body will stay in a place and your mind or your spirit or however you want to say will will kind of go on this like uh, journey uh you know encounter with, so usually a spirit guide is involved um and you know you'll go through all these different things and then you'll come back to your body now we this is this is it sounds sounds easier than it is to explain this all so <laughs> first off um i already explained that um this idea is does this really happen is it a real experience or is it illusionary? We don't really know because we have many document, ca documented cases of people claiming to have left their body and looking at things right. either in near-death experiences or in um, occultic activity, um, in deep meditations and stuff like that. We, we have people, obviously not Christians, and this is something that the Bible condones, but we do have this example in um, New Age, in uh, Scientology, um, in Hinduism, um, really, so it's in a lot of different things there, and, and they all kind of claim the same thing. So it's hard to just dismiss it and say, oh no, that's not really true, when you have so many documented cases. Um, granted, it, it, you can't be real scientific about this, because how are you going to put that in a test tube? You know, hey, are they actually out of their out of their body? Well, you can't really tell, you know. So that brings up the question, is it really happening, where they are genuinely leaving their body, or do they just believe that they are? Illusionary, uh, you know, where, where, where it's a trick, where the demons are, are fooling you, and we're left with possibly either. We don't really know. Um, okay. And then, I go ahead. That, I, a few years ago, I actually witnessed somebody. Put you over there, right? uh, well, let me start over. I, I, would, um, I had somebody at my house that mm -hmm. uh, um, woke up early morning. We had no electricity, no water. It was just a really dark time. And uh, I heard them chanting. Mm -hmm. Like repeating something over and over again, I couldn't understand what it was until I listened closely, and it was the Lord's Prayer mm -hmm. uh, in, in repetition. And so I just I felt the need to join in okay. and pray, and and so I, I kept going for another six, seven times. And when finally this individual woke up, they explained a scenario like this that they were literally in a um, a horror house type setting, you know, and it was and. Uh, 
and essentially their understanding at that point is they were in natural astral projected in yeah and uh, so whether it is like you say it doesn't explain why it's, it's illusionary or not right it's, it's definitely it, yeah exactly it's real it can't be dismissed and and I think that's and it's a dangerous um, place I think yeah. for us um, in, in an individual anywhere to be yeah just, I don't know the way it explains it just kind of leaves you vulnerable yeah absolutely absolutely leaves you vulnerable. Um, and then there's the there's the thing intentional or random. Some people um, who are more involved with these kinds of things um, will randomly go into astral projections even when they're not even trying. So that's why it's kind of a little bit like you know you really don't you really don't you really can't explain it too much. Um, and then sometimes it's intentional, um, which I already talked about through meditation that kind of thing. Um, so some people would say, well, didn't Paul? Do this well okay let's let's calm down there okay. <laughs> this is what it says he says I don't know if it was in act if I was actually there or if, if you know I don't know how it was all I know is I have this really intense revelation he even says that multiple times I don't know if I was actually there or, or if I was there in spirit you know if it was this a vision or was it real in fact in the book of Daniel he talks about this too where he says you know I I, I thought no, I'm sorry. It was in, it's in the book of Acts. P, uh, Peter's doing the same thing, and it says that that he thought the angel frees him out, uh, frees him from from prison, and he, and he thought that it was a vision. So he, he just going along with it until finally he gets to the house, you know, where he's, where he's supposed to be going, and then he realizes, oh, this wasn't a vision. This was real life. So the, Paul even Paul admits that sometimes visions are so intense that you don't know if you're actually there or not. So with that being said. Let's not rush to the conclusion that he was astrally projected, okay? It's possible that God communicated in such a way, but we shouldn't hop to that conclusion when everywhere in the Bible talks about, you know, visions being intense like that. Like uh, Isaiah chapter 6, where it says, that he, well, was he actually in the throne room, throne room of God in heaven? I highly doubt that his physical body was there. See what I mean? Because it wasn't perfected yet, and to stand in, in the presence of God would probably have meant physical death. I mean, the Old Testament talks about this. So, um, probably a vision. Um, and then James also says that the, the, the body without the spirit is, is dead. So, we're left with this hard to answer thing. What does that mean for astral projection? And we just don't have an answer. Um, but nevertheless, um, it is a, definitely a tool of the cult. Um, are you done? Um, and so then that brings us to hypnotism. Now, I do want to give a little bit of, of a, um, what is it called, uh, addendum, uh, side note here. Not all hypnotism is uh, connected with the occult. And so I don't want to sway your opinion on medical hypnotism. I, I don't know. I haven't really um, worked with anyone who's done it. I've never really worked with someone who's been a part of it. And you know, I don't scientifically. I don't. I've never done the research on it, so I don't want to try and sway your opinion. Okay. Um, all I do want to know. All I do want to say is there is a form of hypnotism that the cult uses. One such technique is called regression therapy. This is where, um, through hypnotism, you get in contact with a past life, supposedly. Um, and uh, in fact, in many documented cases, things like this have happened, where you're speaking in a language that the person doesn't know, like a form of French from the middle uh, medieval ages. You know. And uh, so there is definitely something going on there once again, but we know that it's not – you're not getting in contact with the past life because it's appointed man wants to die, as Hebrews 9.27 says, and then the judgment. So we know that you're not actually getting in contact with a past life. So what does that mean? Who are you getting in contact with? Well, with demons. Because remember, demons have been here the whole time. They've been perfecting their art through the thousands of years or however long the world has been here. Plus, they were they were here when that language was spoken. Mm. So, plus, don't don't forget this. In, in demonic possession, um, speaking in in a form of tongues is common. You know, demons will oftentimes speak in a different language besides English. Um, obviously, it's not the same thing as when somebody speaks in tongues through the Holy Spirit. Obviously, but um, it is still a, a tool that they use to get anything to get you to get your attention and belief off of God. So. Um, but that brings us to the idea of, so is all hypnotism bad? I would say probably no. Um, but, I mean, you're really just going to have to go on, on your own on this one because, like I said, I haven't I haven't done any uh, scientific research in medical hypnotism before. 
so I can't really offer too much. All I know is about occultic hypnotism. Um, okay, so we have really two forms of, of angels that we see. Okay, the demons, which are the fallen angels. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, sorry, I'm grouping up. Well, you are watching the child, so mm -hmm. we'll forgive you. No. <laughs> it's been spoken. Oh, excuse me. We have the demons, which are fallen angels. And then we have uh, the angels, which are, you know, the ones that serve God. Now, what an angel means is it means messenger um, or an envoy. Um, uh, in, in Greek, it's the word angelos. You know, it's real, real easy to remember on that. You know, <laughs> angel, angelos. Got it. <laughs> um, but you see a contrast in, in, in what they do, I guess you could say, in their character. Angels are accountable to God, but demons oppose God. Uh, angels are sent by God, obviously, as messengers. Right. Demons are requested by humans and sometimes um, uh, go to humans without being requested. Both. Um, ain't, yes? Are requested by humans. Like in uh, a seance or um, in d divination where you're consult for, for for fortune telling and that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, but sometimes uh, uh, they will kind of um, try to get involved with the person's life without their... Trying to, right, like people who play with Ouija boards or stuff and don't know that it, you know that that's what it does. A demon will oftentimes contact them, even though they're not intentionally trying. You know, um, the, and an angel will respond to God's will, and you know, obviously everything that an angel does will be geared around that. In fact, John says in the Book of Revelations how he tried to worship the angel because of just how how intense the things were around him. And the angel says, no, don't do that. <laughs> I'm like you. I'm just a servant of God. Yeah. Um, and then a demon, on the other hand, will respond to rituals, and usually at their own will. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, an angel, uh, God chooses which an angel to send, whereas in, 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 with the demonic, we kind of choose our favorite angel. You know, it kind of becomes a thing of our, our, spirit, our, our spirit guide, you know, uh, something in, in the other side that we can reach out to and... You know, kind of get a hold of there. Um, okay, so um, I've done the hypnotism a few years ago. It was uh, through access to recovery and stuff for recovering addicts. Uh -huh. And I had uh, hypnotherapy was one of the, the things I did, and where they did the past uh, uh, past life regression. Uh -huh. um, I was a Frenchman. Um, it's 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 really cool to, to see this uh, come full for, uh, circle. Um, but uh, the spirit guide, I didn't find out until years later that that's not something you want. Right. Um, and then there was supposedly my guardian angel that was named. And um, That's so crazy that you're saying all this exactly what we're talking about, yes. And in Hinduism, especially in New Age, this is very common stuff. Very common stuff. Um, you know, getting in, guide, in, in touch with your spirit guide because they're there to help you. And then you find out that, no, they're not there to help you. I mean, you know what I mean? But for a lot of people, they, they, they just don't know. And, you know, they don't read their Bibles, so how can they know, you know? Uh, okay. Um, so, I was on the angels. Uh, angels will fulfill God's will. The demons will fulfill our will at first. At first. They, you know, they'll do whatever you want at first, but then once they kind of get their foot in the door, you'll find that you have less and less control. You have, it's more, you know, whatever they want. We were, we actually had a demon-possessed uh, teenager come to the church, and uh, you could see that he got in it because he was liking it. But you could see that where he was at, he was not liking it anymore. I mean, he was not having fun. Uh, he, he was very uh, psychologically distraught. He was, you know, they were trying to put him on, on, on different kinds of pills to help him, you know, um... Uh, get sleep at night to be able to function and that kind of stuff, um, but he wasn't willing to leave the occultic stuff behind, and so he was, you know, constantly doing this thing that was the very reason why he was having the problems. But the demons were convincing him that God was just a myth or whatever, um, and that he had to, you know, that they that they were the only only things keeping him safe. That if they ever if he ever tried to leave them, that that they would kill him and these kinds of things. You know what I mean? And they'll always kind of tell those kinds of those kinds of um, lies to people to get to keep their feet in the door. Uh -huh. See what I mean? And the longer that you're in the cult, the, really the less control you're going to have in the situation. So. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Okay, and then uh, the angels will speak in the name of God, whereas the demons speak like us if they choose, or they sometimes speak in various tongues and languages and those kinds of things. Whatever, really, whatever. Um, an angel is focused on bringing awe, respect, and fear to God. You know, and, and uh, uh, yeah, I guess I'll leave it out there. Whereas the demons will appear friendly and natural, like us. Hey, you know, there's you don't have to worry about what God says. You know, we're actually here. You know, and, and, and seances—that's really what the idea is. 
you know, um, you know, here's this here's this person that you miss, and it's like, well, no, that's not actually the person that you miss. You know, that's a demon pretending to be the person that you that you miss. Mm -hmm. So, and, and yeah. So, any questions on that before I go ahead? One more. Yeah, go ahead. Um, a lot of this I guess I've experienced, um, like the the Samuel thing. Um, I had uh, I don't know if any of y'all are uh, familiar with Ray K. Uh, don't become familiar. I'm not telling you to, because <laughs> I think it has a cult uh, um, connection. Uh -huh. But on a third session of Ray K, I was basically on a massage table. And my friend was doing her thing where she was just, you know, relaxing my body and stuff. And, yeah. and, and then all of a sudden, it's like there's someone here to talk to. They explained the blanket that my grandmother made. Uh -huh. um, talked about the reason she made it. Yeah. Um, and then mentioned something that told, told me to let it go. Um, and for years, I tried to figure out what the heck was I supposed to let go of. My addiction, you know, my yeah. house, my relationship, you know, but uh, I didn't ask for it. Yeah. So it really spooked me. Yeah. Just like, what's going on here? Is this real? Is this not? Is this really grandma? Why would grandma come and talk to me? <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's been done for seven years at that point. So yeah. It's just. You know, I, I was going to put that in here. Uh, I can never pronounce it right. It was Reiki, right? Reiki, yeah. Yeah. I was, was going to put that in here, and I don't know if I did or not um, in the in the final thing, but it's cool that you brought it up anyways, right? Man, that's cool. Um, okay, so uh, the call type, I just want to kind of put all this on there at the same time, um, you know, because it brings up why do people even get into the cult? Well, there's a lot of reasons why people get into the cult. Everything from just... Sheer ignorance, you know, not knowing that that, that that that's what they're doing. It isn't this natural thing to so, to other people who are genuinely seeking something. Um, like we were talking about that that pastor even who you know lost his child and he was just so distraught about it, so that he started going to seances for, to contact his, his dead son because he you know he it was hard for him to let go. So really, people have a lot of different reasons as to why. Um, but in our culture, I think it's important to notice how. Um, we're not. Our, America isn't overly concerned with facts so much as feelings, you know. Which is funny because we have some of the highest ability to understand science in the modern day, but people are becoming less and less satisfied with science and, and actual truth, and more and more with just you know make your own truth. You know, whatever you say is, is good. You know, and uh, so the cult it's exciting. You know, it's something that is unnatural. It's something that that, 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 that seems like, hey, this is something that, that that's fun. Um, it's mystifying. Uh, it's appealing. You, you, you can kind of see how, with all the things that we've been going with, it's unknown. It's not the boring day-to-day, -day, right? Because we all kind of get out of high school and think we're going to change the world, and then we just kind of get in the ruts of the same job or the same town. We just we think, yeah, this is kind of boring. And the cult offers a little bit of a freedom from that, you know what I mean? Even for teenagers who haven't yet had their dreams squashed, you know? <laughs> uh, where it just seems like something um, something fun and exciting. Um, it seems powerful. Uh, it's a substitute for God. We don't have to submit ourselves to God. We don't have to change. We can just come as we are and stay the way we are, whereas God will change us into the image of Christ, changes into a righteous person. Um, the cult says, hey, you don't have to change. You're fine the way you are. You don't need a savior. You know, um, The cult really is, if you think about it, it's, it's a spiritual na narcotic. You know, uh, physical narcotics. What happens? Hallucinations. You know, removed from reality. You get this, this, uh, you know, this freedom and stuff. Uh, well, for a time. And spiritual. Uh, the cult is kind of like a spiritual narcotic. You know, you, you see things that aren't really true. You, you feel like an escape from reality. You, you, uh, you know, just, you can just kind of see where I'm going there. Um, and for a lot of people, it seems, it seems easier than God. You know, God seems maybe like distant or removed from us. Maybe, maybe um, I'm just too bad of a person to, you know, to encounter God. But with the cult, you know, that just kind of glosses over that. It just doesn't matter, you know. Um, and then it also seems closer than God. It seems like God is this unreachable force, it's just out there somewhere. Whereas with the cult, it seems like, well, I can get an answer now. I can get, you know, um, you know, what, what I'm looking for now. But it has all these disclaimers to it, and those things aren't even true, anyways. It's not easier than God, and it's not closer than God, but we've convinced ourselves because sometimes I think we're just kind of scared of facing God with, with us because the idea of, 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 a, of an all-powerful being that truly knows us to our core, you know, that, that's kind of a scary thought. We can't hide things from, from him, you know what I mean? When, when we premeditate our sin, when we're doing our sin, when, when we realize that we've sinned, you know, there's this idea that God saw us the whole time. 
You know, when we repent and say, Lord, forgive me, and there's still in the back of our head that, that knowledge that, well, what if I sin again? You know, and, and there, there's that there's that kind of that, that, that fear, you know, um, and with the cult, it kind of just seems to be so much easier. But then you get into it, and you're heaped with so much fear, you can't even see straight. You know, you you get into it, and, and you can't just leave whenever you want. It's like the it's like the mob. You know, it's like a it's like a binding force. You, you think that there's never going to be a day when you're free from it, and so all kinds of stuff like that. Um, which brings us to the idea of astrology. Um, there's two basic ideas of, of astrology. The first is called natal. That's prediction based on your character, your situation, or your future outlook based on your birth date. Um, sometimes if the reading seems off, they'll switch it to your time of conception, which how they can figure that one out, you got me. <laughs> um, then there's mundane astrology. Well, this is prediction on a larger scale, more like um, national and civil issues. Okay, like um, You saw this a lot in the ancient world where a king would go to... Uh, a diviner to, to foretell the future um, and, and you know hey will I be successful in this uh, conquest of this other kingdom or whatever um, yes I can well I got it never mind okay guess what disturbs me the most about this is there are some people that truly believe that they're serving God um, in these occult yes. activities yes that is exactly what we were talking about Exactly what we were talking about a couple because weeks ago. Yeah. You know. The lady that did the hip, uh, hip, hypnotism with me, I've known her for years. She was an old high school teacher. Uh -huh. And we talked about God a lot. Yeah. And yeah, so it's just spooky. Yeah. In my, I don't know if you were, I probably weren't. No, you, you, I don't think you were there. But my, my dad was preaching on, a, or teaching, I guess, on a Wednesday night. And he was talking about how when he, when, uh, he started going to church, you know, after he got, had gotten saved, um, there was a woman who was in the church that did psychic readings and stuff, and she um, she uh, had told him. I'm sorry, this was before he was saved. Um, she had told him that uh, you know on this certain day that he was that something was going to happen to him that that would that would he wouldn't be an alcoholic anymore. And it turned out that that was the day that he got saved. You know, and this was a woman from the church. That, that had, you know, done this, you know, and it was just like, well, but God says don't do that, though, you know what I mean? And, and yet she was still claiming to be a Christian, just like you're saying, and yet was still involved in this. And and my dad is an unsaved, you know, uh, drug addict. You know, this was the, what was the idea of, of church and Christianity that he saw, which is just, yeah, absolutely, yes, absolutely. Just so when it comes down to it, it, it reiterates the fact that every good and perfect thing, uh, gift, um, uh, it's a it's a um, but it comes down to the will of God. Yeah. That God will utilize um, the circumstances of a bad situation. Right. Just as much as you know, it does kind of seem like that. How did she know that, have that information? Well, it, there's only two solutions if you think about it. A, demons know some future dates and events. How they know that, we don't know. Do they? Does God tell them? You know, we don't know. Or B, that God will interfere in the midst of what the demonic is trying to do. Mm -hmm. We're only left with those two solutions. Right. Yeah. Um, but we do know that God tells us not to seek in those kinds of things. No. So we're left with this little bit of a conundrum of, of, you know, does God break through or is it a demon or we don't know. <laughs> you know, and just that, that unanswered question I think is what kills me because I'm, I'm a guy that likes answered questions. Right. I like to know and I like to know what I know. Yeah. Let's leave it at that. But with a lot of things with the cult, you don't know. All you know is God says, don't do it. You know, and then some things do actually happen. And so it's like, well, I don't know. Um, astrology is really just packed full of contradictions and just general vagueness. You know what I mean? Um, even past the horoscopes, um, really fortune telling in general. Um, and, and we talked about Nostradamus two weeks ago. You know, we're... People are like, oh, you know, hey, whatever. But the thing is, is he didn't prophesy according to what God said. And his prophecies weren't interpreted until after the events happened, and then they just were kind of attributed to it. None of Nostradamus' uh, prophecies were, you know, if you read through them, they're, they're more like gibberish than anything. But, I mean, they could be attributed to many different things, you know. And with God's prophets, they're clearer, and they actually happen. 
You know what I mean? And sometimes they'll have multiple fulfillment, fulfillments. You know, like the whole thing um, with, that Daniel prophesies. He says, when you, uh, the, the desolation, you know, that happens in Jerusalem. Well, that happened, you know, uh, before the Roman Empire was there. But then Jesus said, when you see it happen, you know that the day is coming. So it's like, well, so that means that there was going to be a second desolation, or abomination of desolation that was going to happen. See what I mean? So you, you left with this kind of like a, hmm. Uh, but nevertheless, they are they are clear and they actually do happen 100% of the time. But with astrology, it's kind of a hit or miss kind of thing. Um, and there's also, there is no proof that stars radiate power that affect us. There's no proof that the heavens have any kind of a, a kind of a um, um, impact on our life. You know, so there is that. Um, astrology is basically based off of hit or miss, let's hope that what we're saying is true. Um, also, there's a few a few obvious problems. Um, the moment of conception or birth. If you can pick and choose which one it is, then that means that astrology is, that is not 100% accurate. And why I believe something that's not accurate. Also, there's a problem with daylight savings time. Right. What about the places that do observe it against the places that don't? Well, the astrology doesn't take that into account. Also, um, horoscopes are still based on a on an Earth centric universe. Uh, it's called a geocentric universe. But if you know anything about science, <laughs> we follow the heliocentric method. The sun is the center of our of our little deal going on here, right? right? But they still follow the Earth being the center, which is outdated by I mean hundreds of years here, guys, <laughs> hundreds of years. You know, so it's kind of like okay. Uh -huh. Then there's also this impossible to ca calculate planetary positions for anyone born above or below 66 degrees latitude. Okay. It's impossible. It only has an accuracy of a little window on on the planet Earth. Okay, and so anything below that is going to be off. Um, horoscopes, therefore, are not always true. But then there's more. But wait, there's more. Um, <laughs> there's slight cultural changes and slight adaptations in the practices of giving horoscopes and astrology readings, which means that one of them has to be right and one of them has to be wrong. If there's differences in the different cultures. Right? I mean, doesn't that stand to reason? But wait, there's more. <laughs> um, and I'll, I'll, and this, is a, this is a direct quote from Walter Martin's um, Kingdom of the Cult. When Alexandrian astrologers began standardizing the zodiacal um, calendar about 100 BC, the sun, due to the vernal equinox, entered the sign of Aries on March 21st. Newtonian astronomy, 1687, showed us that the equinox is moving a full 30 degrees zodiacal sign every 2,180 years. Now, I'll explain this in just a second. People who are born on March 21st through April 19th are actually born under the sign Pisces the fish. Those who think they are born under Taurus the bull are actually born under Aries. Each sign now takes on its preceding sign. What that means is that every 2,180 years, it doesn't add up with... I don't know how to break that down anymore. Um, okay. How do I want to say that? To me? I, I, I mean, I don't know how to say that any clearer. Basically, how the, how the, the stars align change by 30 degrees every 2,180 years. And so people who are who believe that they are born under a certain sign nowadays are actually under this previous sign than they think they are because it doesn't e perfectly add up. Okay. Um, the only thing I can compare it to is, you know how there's technically 365 days every year? Yeah. Well, actually, and a fourth. It's a little bit off. You know what I mean? Yeah, that, that's the closest kind of... Yeah, <laughs> I can kind of get you. Does this, right. that make sense? Yeah, I, I'm trying to explain something that I don't know the words to use. That's why I did a direct quote because I was like, if I try and explain this, I'm going to mess it up. So you if know. we didn't, so if we didn't observe uh, leap year, or leap year or whatever, uh, February 29th, mm -hmm. our calendar would be out of line. Yes. Uh, drastically, right? Yes. So same concept. Yes. Huh. Yes. Wow. And so then there's that. Except so people. Accounted for it here, so I'm not really a Pisces. <laughs> right. Well, um, really do you kind of, do you guys kind of get what I'm saying? Hmm. Does that make any sense? The way yeah. it was, you kind of explained it. It's kind of like tectonic plates moving. Yeah. Like kind it's of. not where it was. You know, right. This yeah. long. Right. And so I guess the the takeaway from this is that people who think that they're this sign are actually the previous sign. Okay. But then there's more problems with astrology. Um, <laughs> constellations are not divided equally in the sky. If you know the constellations, they're not equal in the sky. Okay. Some of them take up a big place, some of them take up a little place. Mm -hmm. Well, how does that affect the reading? Because that technically doesn't mean that everyone has its own month. 
it would be some are shorter months, some are longer months. See what I mean? Yeah. You kind of get what I'm saying? But with astrology, you kind of just have to throw that into the wind and just pretend like everything is equal when it's not. But then there's more problems. And I'm telling you guys, I don't even know why astrology has ever become a thing. Right. Um, what about multiple births where the characters are different? The characteristics <laughs> of, of the two twins are different. Like, if two children are born at the same time, like, either same womb or next to each other, mm -hmm. and they have two different characteristics and two different paths, well, then the horoscope would only be true for one of them and not the other one. Mm -hmm. um, a good example of this is um, Jacob and Esau, you know, where the totally different people, but they were born right after... I mean, literally, Jacob was holding on to Esau's foot. I mean, that's pretty darn close, right? Yeah. But now, now here's the thing. Some astrologers will say, well, a difference of four minutes will, will make a difference. And, another, and others say, no, it won't make a difference at all. So you're left with this, well, which one is true and which one's not true? Because only one person can be right. I mean, either the sun is, you know, a star or it is not a star. I mean, you can't have yes and no. Um... What about new planets being discovered? How does that affect past horoscopes and present? Yeah. And what about the ones we haven't discovered yet? Are previous horoscopes invalid because they didn't know about these planets, or are modern-day horoscopes invalid because they do know about them? <laughs> Which one? Also, there's the issue of what about Pluto being ruled not really a planet? <laughs> so how does that deal with all of this? But wait, guys, I kid you not, there is actually more. That takes us to the idea of, are they giving educated guesses? Because only some horoscopes and astrology in general is, is accurate some of the time. You can have the same astrologer be right and not right, and right and wrong, you know, uh, both. So, you know, it's not the person. Then, you know, the horoscopes are sometimes right and sometimes wrong. So, you know, it's not the horoscope. So, how, what are we supposed to base the horoscope or the astrology in general on? Um, if it is right, then how is it right? Um, and then there, there's this idea, and I'm going to elaborate this a little more on the next slide, so um, don't worry too much about it. A lot of people on Facebook and stuff say, I do it just for fun. But the thing is, don't practice a cult just for fun any more than you practice pornography for just for fun, right? Uh, motives don't make idolatry okay. La it's laughing in God's face. Now, I know you told me not to do this, God, but I'm going to do it anyways because I'm, it's not that big of a deal. You can see which side of the argument I stand on on the whole horoscope thing. I totally think it's not okay. Um, I go as far as if I'm reading the newspaper, I'll just completely avoid that section. If I'm at a Chinese restaurant, unless the unless the fortune cookies are like jokes, you know, like um, Gracie was talking about the misfortune cookies where it's like, you'll die today, you know, where it's just like it's not meant to be serious. Or like the ones that aren't really fortunes, they're just like, um, like, um, yeah. Like, you know, if you want to be a good leader, you know, don't look behind, look ahead. You know, stuff like that. Well, that's not really a fortune, is it? Yeah. See what I mean? Uh, I won't even read fortune, cookie, fortune cookies if it's an actually supposed to be a fortune. I, I won't read the lucky numbers. I won't even gamble. So, I mean, that should tell you, like, how far away from astrology I, I take things. I just go way to the other side. Um, now, I understand that some people don't see it like that, like we were talking last week where, where Ben um, Ben was one of the, um, I guess, instigators of the other view. Uh, I'm not trying to condemn that view. I know some other people here took that view too. I'm just saying I don't see how it will fit with a biblical idea. Um, Satan, um, I, I want to bring this up while I'm thinking about it too. Satan and the demonic don't know all events of the future. They may, uh, this is up in the air, they may know some things that are going to happen. But they probably don't know um, don't know everything. And we already talked about that they don't know what we're thinking. Okay, But, think about this. Would Satan have rebelled if he knew what would happen in, in, of his defeat? Well, probably not. No sane person would, right? So we're left with that. They probably don't know all events, right? Because... You know, and so that leaves us with the idea that they probably don't know, they, they probably, how do I want to say this? They probably know some future events. I don't know how they know, but they probably do know some future events. That's my opinion. I don't necessarily see a validation of that in scripture, so I'm giving a full warning there. I might be wrong on that one. Um, and we know for a fact that angels have limited knowledge even of things that aren't prophecy. You know, uh, they don't fully understand the things of God, for instance. Even angels. So we know that demons, even less so. Um, 
For instance, uh, the mystery of Jesus being born was something that the angels longed to know, but they didn't know until it happened, and then God showed them, hey, this was that thing. You know, the Bible talks about this and how angels do have limited knowledge. Um, so there is that. Um, um, could it be also that they don't necessarily know certain future events or that, but because of the things that they're acting towards in that, influencing people in uh -huh. certain ways, this would be the outcome if this... Oh, so basically just out. based off of <clears throat> statistics. Basically, is what you're saying. Yeah. Like a, a, a demon figure, supposing something. You know, that's possible too. Without a clear yes or no from Scripture, remember, it, we don't have a definite answer. Yeah. So that could be true. You know, we really don't know. Um, and so just uh, a few other things. A cult is always yes and no. They don't give... Uh, the, the cult doesn't give a straight answer. It's always like, believe what you want. You know what I mean? Like with astrology and people who, who, who use, this, use the horoscopes and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, they say, well, it's okay because it might be true, so I'll still do it. So it's yes and no? Well, yeah, you know, it's true and not true. If it's true for you, then it's true. And it's like, well, it's either yes or no, but with the cult, it's always yes and no. to try And, and you see this with the New Age movement too, trying to be all-inclusive to suck people in. You know, it's not really about equality so much as, as um, I guess you could say, uh, Satan trying to establish something. Um, and then you also see um, that hermetic principle that we talked about a few weeks ago, as above, so below. You see it repeated in astrology, too. You know, where the idea that what's up there affects what's down here. You know, and, and you, you even see Christians getting into this. I, bouncing off of what Michael already said, um, you know, where... Like, the whole thing happened with the new moons. And so people like John Hagee really milked that one dry, preying off people's fear, even though Bible's, the Bible says nobody knows, the, nobody knows the hour. You know, these things are – there are going to be signs in the heavens. Don't mistake me for that. But those will happen at the time of the tribulation. They won't happen to signal the time of the tribulation. There will be miracles, things that you won't see coming, but they will happen when it is that time. See what I mean? We're not going to see all these signs in the heavens and say, okay, that means at this day, this is going to be the end of the world. Well, no, no. No, it's been predicted so many times. You would yes. Think people would would like, finally would stop? Yeah. But they don't. They just keep going. If it's not yeah. Y2K, it's the blood boons, I swear. Um, you know, and, and, and when even Christians, quote-unquote Christians, are getting involved in this, the world is seeing false prophecies, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so they're starting to discredit the actual true prophecies. On account of the, supposed Christians with their false prophecies. And here's the thing. You know that most of the prophecies in the entire Bible have been fulfilled already? Most of them. Not all of them. There's a lot that have yet to be fulfilled. But my point being, all those prophecies were given before the events happened, and then they actually happened just as they were described. You know, And, and they weren't just off about some, oh, it could have meant that. I mean, you read the book of Isaiah and Jeremiah where they're talking to the kings and they're saying, look, this is what's going to happen. You know, And then that thing does happen. Right. You know, it's like, well, these can't just be, you know, hey, whatever, no. you know. Um, but then at the end of the day, astrology is fatalistic. We are predetermined, and nothing you do in life matters. And astrologers will always try to get around this, but at the end of the day, if you can tell someone's future by the stars, that means it was pre-written. It's there. All you have to do is discern what is there. In other words, nothing you do matters. See what I mean? And some people, that, that's a real encouragement for them. Like, yeah, you know, hey, I've got you know absolute certainty. And that, to me, doesn't seem like there's any certainty. God always talks about some things are, are definitely for certain, absolutely. But there's always in life, you know, if you do this, this is what's going to happen. If you do this, this is what... I mean, that's the entire idea of Deuteronomy and, Jewish, and Joshua where he's talking about, now, if you do this, I will bless you. And if you do this, I'll, I'll curse you. You know, there's these different things that, you know, the idea that your, your choices do matter. Uh, Hebrews where it says, today, if you call on the name of the Lord. Well, what good does that do if we're prede predetermined to call on the name of the Lord or not? See what I mean? It just doesn't give you any, any, and none of that, that does not give you any, clear, any, any comfort. But then it brings up the question, so I'm either damned to hell or I'm <laughs> determined to go to heaven. And with that being said, then... You know, basically, God becomes a bad guy, too, because that would mean Adam and Eve sinned because God made them sin. You know what I mean? You have a bunch of things, and it just doesn't add up with what the Bible says. You know, and, and with astrology, you can't fail to arrive at fatalism. 
if it is in the sky, and I talked about this when I preached a couple weeks ago, the star that appeared when Jesus was born, it was it, it appeared after Jesus was born, not before. That when they, by the time that they arrived, after they had seen the stars, Jesus was about two years old. And so Herod had to go through the whole town killing all the kids two years and under because he didn't know what the time, yeah, what was the, what time specifically, he didn't know. He just based, probably around this time, based on what the wise men said. Right. See what I mean? They didn't see a sign that appeared before fact, or else they would have been there at his birth. So how come the, the, the three, the wise men, when they showed up, that he was still a baby then? I mean, he was like... Ten. It doesn't say that he was a baby. It says that when the shepherds showed up, he was still in, it was in the manger. That was in oh, Luke. Okay. Two different Gospels. One of them uh, only mentions the Magi, which I believe is Matthew. The other one only mentions the shepherds, which I believe is Luke. Yeah. See what I mean? And so if you notice, they weren't there at the same time either. Yeah. The angels were out. I mean, the shepherds were out keeping their flocks, and the angels disrupted them and said, Hey, over there, some really cool stuff is happening. So they go, and they're like, Okay, awesome. But then two years later, I enter the scene the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Magi, the, the wise men, and they have uh, you know these gifts to give him, and he's already you know about two years old at this time. Yeah. Which makes me wonder why who came up with the nativity sets. Yeah. Okay, let's be honest there. Okay, it never says that there are three wise men. It never says that. And also, um, it doesn't say that they were all there at the same time. Right. <laughs> two different gospels talking about two different events. And also, it never says that, like the the uh, when I saw giraffes were even there uh, or horses or whatever were all gathered around the manger. Why would an animal be gathered around a, around the manger where a baby was? I mean, but, yeah. you know what I mean. Also, here's another idea. It probably wasn't outside. The way they built their houses back then, it was probably the bottom floor of a house. Mm. Yeah. So there's that too. <laughs> So there's all these different things that are just like, wow, that's probably not how it looked back in the day, you know. And then the manger always looks like this really, you know, nice and neat looking, you know, thing. And it's like, what are you I talking about? It wasn't a bed. It was yeah, where they a special made crib. <laughs> right. And it, it wasn't a crib. But I'm getting, I'm getting off. So I'm, I'm sorry. Back, back on the thing. Um, astrology really ends up with the idea that it is fatalistic, you know. Um, and then there's this, and I cannot let this go. This is something that, that you're trusting your life with. This is questions you should be asking if you're trusting your life with this. Success is random. They have accidental correct conclusions sometimes. See what I mean? Like the, That's not something you want to dedicate your life to. That just seems like a bad idea. So astrology lacks two important things to make it a good system of, of method, besides God condoning it. You know, obviously that. Um, it lacks details. It says things too ambiguous. You know, there are there aren't those clear details, especially modern day horoscopes. Right. And then they lack success rates. It has to be one hundred percent right, and it has to actually say something that'll set it apart from a general, you know, horoscope. Like, hey, you know, today you're gonna walk around. You know, oh well, thank you for that horoscope. I'm, you know, I'm real glad you clued me into what my life's really gonna be like. So <laughs> that takes me to to my view of astrology and horoscopes. Um, can you go back? Yes, yes, I can. Sorry, I keep. Forgetting to tell you. Stop it now. <laughs> I thought you were talking to me. I was like, sorry, girlfriend. <laughs> Stay um, in your lane. <laughs> Stay in your lane. <laughs> oh, my gosh, yes. Um, occult practices are not an objective thing. You know what I mean? They're not just something that, that are that are uninfluenced. They're just they're just a thing. It's not the thing that makes it it makes it evil. Occultic things aren't like that. The thing themselves are evil. You know what I mean? Um, you can't possibly own a Ouija board and say, hey, you know, it's not evil as long as I'm not consulting demons on it. Well, you know, well, that's, what it's for. <laughs> that's what it's made for. You can't own an idol in your house and say, hey, it's fine. I'm it's just there. When 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 the law says, you know, about the things of the idols, it, it's implying, it, not in English, it doesn't translate very well, but in, in the Hebrew, it is implying the idea of not even owning the things, not even, you know, and then you see whenever they're um, purifying themselves, it says that they got rid of all the idols in the house. Why would they get rid of the idols in their house if it didn't matter? You know, it's just things like that, where, you know, they are active forces that the demonic will use to get in your household. I've even seen demons being able to affect children through owning a movie, okay? I kid you not. It was the the one about the, the exorcist. Yeah, you know, there you go. The, about the exorcism, exorcist. <laughs> yes, it was. The, and the person just owned it. They hardly ever watched it, and their child started having nightmares. As soon as they got rid of the movie, nightmares stopped. 
You see what I mean? Like, it, yeah. you can't even explain that kind of stuff. Like, it was just in the house. It wasn't even being watched since they had the child. I've known of people who were in the cult and they left the cult and, and, and you know, they were praying to God and they, they just felt like they were hitting a brick wall. But they weren't serving the cult anymore. They were even see, uh, serving God. Why wasn't God answering them? Well, because they had never renounced Satan. They had never gotten rid of the satanic influence in their house. They had never gotten rid of the things. They were still keeping them, you know, whatever. You know, it's not that big of a deal. When it was a big deal, though. And that's what you have to understand about the things of the cult. It's not just, oh, I read the horoscope for fun. The things of the cult are inherently evil. And God specifically commands against them. You have to see them as what they are. They are an active force from Satan. Next, uh, 1 Thessalonians, Thessalonians 5.22. It helps if you actually say the name of the book, you know. Uh, <laughs> 1 Thessalonians. Thessalonians. It's in there somewhere. 1 Thessalonians 5.22 says this. Abstain from every form of... Of evil, and the word there. If you look at, if you have NASB, it'll say in, in the bottom note there. It says or appearance. That's a pretty accurate. And once again, this NASB claims to be the most accurate translation of the Bible. So I mean, I grabbed this one on purpose because that's pretty accurate to the idea of the word. Abstain is something that even appears to be evil. Stay away from things that even could be interpreted as evil. Why? Not just for the sake of other people, but for your own sake too. You know, and then there's there's more though. First Corinthians ten twelve, which says, um, "Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall." There are many documented cases of Christians who thought that it wasn't a big deal to 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 get involved with the cultic things. I'm not just talking about the horoscopes here. I'm talking about other things too. You know, like seances and stuff. I'm protected. I can I can mess with the Ouija board. It's not going to affect me. See. And then it does. And I think this verse directly relates with that. Take heed because you think you're gonna. I'm good. I, you know, I, I'm righteous enough. I'm spiritual enough. Lest you fall. So that is worth noting. Um, Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 12. And I'm gonna read some of these again at the end. So um, I actually have a whole slide with just uh, scripture references. 18, 9 through 12 says this: When you enter the land which the Lord your God gives you, you shall not learn to imitate the detestable things of those nations. You shall not learn to imitate those things. Okay. Now, our culture believes in the horoscope. Our culture reads the horoscope. You know what I mean? That doesn't make it right. Uh, there, um, there shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire. That is uh, human sacrifice. Uh, one who uses divination. That, once again, we talked about the word di divination. It's, it's an umbrella term. Uh, it, you know, astrology, um, you know, seances, all these kinds of different things are kind of under there. Divination, most broadly, is the idea of fortune telling. Most broadly, but it can apply to other forms of too. So there is that. Um, one who practices witchcraft, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer. Now these are things that technically could be related to, to divination, but he repeats them again using different words just to clarify what he's saying. I think that's kind of important. Or one who casts a spell, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. Well, a spiritist is oftentimes equated with witchcraft and divination. Right. But it's listed again, so he uses at least. Three different words to describe the same idea. I think that's worth noting. God yeah. so much hates this that he's willing to say it in three different ways. Right. Um, or one who calls up the dead. For whoever does these things is detestable to the Lord, and because of these detestable things, the Lord your God will drive them out before you. This is why I'm bringing my judgment on them, because they're doing these things. I think we need to be careful about this. You know what I mean? Yes, we are free from the law, but that doesn't mean we can live as lawless. Does that make sense? Right. That doesn't mean we can just make up our rules. It's still God's rules. It's still God's way of life. In fact, Paul even says like this, you know, don't let your 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 salvation, your freedom in Christ be an opportunity to sin. Right. These are the deeds of the flesh, which are very evident, and these are the deeds of the spirit. These are this is how you kinda you can kind of tell what's right and wrong, you know what I mean, by these things. You know, but then also there's the idea that just because it's in the Old Testament doesn't mean we should ignore it. In fact, I'll go the opposite way. The entire Bible is based off the law. Genesis through Deuteronomy. Right. All the prophets, all the historical books, all the New Testament, it's all based off of Genesis through Deuteronomy. If you don't understand Genesis through Deuteronomy, you're not going to understand the rest of the Bible. Right. And you're going to you know, not even you know, see the see things through. But what happened, what's happening in our culture, because remember, emotions is number one. If it feels okay, then it's okay. 
you know, I don't think it's that big of a deal to, to do these things. Well, it's like, well, it doesn't matter what we think is a big deal. It matters what God said is a big deal. If you notice here, he used the word detestable three times in this short passage here. Look at, at first it says it in um, 9. <coughs> you shall not learn to imitate the detestable things. Okay. Then you hop down and he lists all the detestable things. And you get to verse 12. For whoever does these things is detestable again to the Lord. And then again, and because of these detestable things, Lord your God will drive them out before you. Three times he uses the word detestable. Yeah. There's only a few things that he uses that strong of language about. He says, "Hey, don't do this. You know, don't don't sew don't don't sew, sew an old garment with a new garment. You know, all these different things. Uh, don't trim the edges of your beard. You know, all these different things that really, if you notice the culture, it has to do with, more with the cultic things. And I don't really want to get into that because this isn't a lesson on Leviticus or Deuteronomy." Uh, you know, but then he gets to these things here, and he doesn't even he, he doesn't say, "Hey, don't do these things." He says, "These things are absolutely detestable. They're absolutely detestable. I absolutely hate them, 100 percent." You know, it's not like uh, there was no leeway on this thing. In, in Exodus, I don't know if I wrote that down. Yes, Exodus 22:18, he says, "Put to death the sorcerer." That's simple. He doesn't say because of this, or you know, he just says, "Kill the sorcerer from among you." None of that. Um, so stay away from the evil. Absolutely, stay away from the evil. Um, the world of the occult, both lulls and pools. Okay, I want to break that down. First off, the occultic things lull us to sleep spiritually. They catch us off guard. They kind of you know make us think things aren't a big deal. They make us apathetic towards the things of God. And the more we partake of them rather than taking up a stand against them, the more we're spiritually just put to sleep. But then they don't just lull. They also pull us. Many Christians have fallen away from the faith or like we were talking about, start taking up the occultic things because that's what the occultic things do. They pull on us. They're not just an objective thing out there. They're very much subjective. And who are they subjected to? Satan. And they're used to get his foot in the door of our lives. And the, the thing is, do you, do you want to play with that or do you not want to play with it? That's why I so strongly take a stance against even horoscopes. I absolutely think, think that you don't even read them for fun. Um, so just a few ideas here. Your intentions don't matter when you are dealing with occultic things. Absolutely. It doesn't matter if you intended good in reading the horoscopes. It just doesn't matter. Don't be afraid of cult, but neither partake of it. This is People go to the extremes on this. Either they're so enamored with the occultic world that they're just afraid of it. You know, oh, no. Or they go to the other extreme and say, I'm a Christian. I'm saved by grace. This, it's not going to – I know where I am in my salvation. Okay. What? It won't, affect it won't affect me. I'm 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 free of this, and we don't have to go to either of those extremes. Okay, you don't have to be afraid of these things. Christ's blood is sufficient, right. and nothing can overpower Christ's blood. However, but, don't partake of it. <laughs> I mean, don't be stupid here, guys. Um, if you know it's wrong, I'm sorry. If you don't know it's wrong, it's still wrong. The people of Canaan who were driven out, this was common practice for them. They woke up, and their parents did it. As they got ready to go to die, you know, their kids were doing it. I mean, this was a common practice. In fact, the people of Canaan, Canaan were, were more wicked than all the other places. Um, through archaeology and that kind of stuff, we can pinpoint that um, child sacrifice was mostly extinct by the time the law was given. Except for one big area. You want to take a guess where that was? Canaan, the land that would become Israel's promised land. It, um, the uh, Egypt had long since done away with it. Um, the Middle East, uh, not the Middle East, the the Fertile Crescent is what it was called in studies. But um, nowadays, like you know, um, along the Euphrates and the Tigris, uh, Mesopotamia—that's what it's called. Uh, Mesopotamia um, was w was mostly done away with there. And so then people today say, "See, the Bible's wrong. This wasn't even a practice anymore." No, 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 no. It wasn't a practice in those places, but it was in Canaan. So I think that that's important because if you notice, God didn't take Israel to Egypt and drive out the Egyptians, and he didn't take them to Mesopotamia and drive them out. He took them to Canaan and drove those people out, and he specifically gives a reason. Because they did these things. Yeah, so I think that's kind of worth noting. You know, It's not something that needs to be just laughed off. And then also the Bible says very clearly, for lack of knowledge my people perish. I think that that's worth noting when we're talking about, hey, as long as I don't, you know, as I don't mean anything by. And then we ha we're also faced with what Jesus said about Sodom and Gomorrah. He said, if Sodom and Gomorrah had seen the miracles that I had done today in these in these villages, they would have repented. You know, it, but those those Israelite towns didn't repent. So going back, we're talking about these people didn't get the same warnings as we have in a full revelation right. now, but instead of Saying, okay, this is what God has revealed, that's what I'm going to stick with. 
we're trying to give excuses to what we're doing, which is a bad idea. So my view, absolutely stay away from it. Absolutely. It doesn't matter if you do it just for fun or not. It's testable. If you don't believe in them, all the more reason why you shouldn't read them. You know, it, people. I, I'm always confused when people say this. Well, I don't really believe in the horoscope. I just read them for fun. Well, if you don't believe in it, that's all the more reason why you shouldn't read it. I mean, hey, why complicate your life by reading something you don't? It's I'm fine. Wasting your time. <laughs> it, it's fine. I'll pick it up later. You don't have to worry about it. Um, you're right. Re wasting your time. It's like, hey, you know, if I don't have a problem with gambling, you know, maybe I shouldn't gamble so I don't get addicted to gambling. Yeah. Right. And then if you yeah. it happens one day, then I keep reading the next day. Right. Uh -huh. Right. And that's actually how a lot of people get suckered into it. So, um, there's many documented cases of people getting sucked into the cult because of harmless exposure. It's inherently evil and not to be accepted. Absolutely. Uh, avoid that part of the paper or don't get the. Yeah. I already mentioned. It. Okay. Um, now here's the thing. Some people say, well, if you abstain from the cult, thanks or from these things in life, won't I be losing out? Sometimes I can see how people are saying that. Yes, you won't be able to watch movies, you know, they have that kind of stuff in it. You'll be missing out on that term. You know, when your friends, hey, hey, we're going to watch this scary movie for Halloween. I mean, you will be missing out on that kind of stuff. You know, there is that. But here's the thing. It's worth missing out on. Yeah. You know, like Hebrews talks about Moses and it says, you know, he, he gave up the wealth of, of living in Pharaoh's house. It wasn't worth it. See what I mean? And Jesus said it like this. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? Right. You know, well, that's not really losing out. You see what I mean? If you think about it, it's not really losing out. You're not missing anything. Um, so I wanted to um, to briefly mention a movie that I saw recently um, that actually had a lot of occultic themes in it. So I wanted to, to say it so you guys kind of see how it's kind of coded in because you'd be surprised. The cult is everywhere around you. Like, you'd be so surprised. <laughs> um, first off, the biblical miracles are repeated. Um, people walking on water, water splitting in two. Um, I'm talking about the most recent one. It was called um, Dead Men Tell No Tells. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And I actually just uh, turned it off. Like, Gracie was trying to finish it up, even though she really wasn't enjoying it. But then when I kept pointing out the occultic thing, she's like, yeah, let's just turn it off. <laughs> um, the biblical miracles repeated. And the occult, they will always, always, always do variations of, of God's miracles. Always. Always, like with the, I can never say it, the Reiki, 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 whatever. You know, it, it, it's healing, you know, hey, but not really, you know what I mean? Like, oh, you're a spirit guide, this is someone who's there. God gave us the Holy Spirit, like, we don't need a spirit guide, you see what I mean? Like, there's a big difference there, but they'll always try to imitate, always try to imitate. Um, there was witchcraft in it, there's actually, a, I don't know if she was a technically a witch or a sorcerer, I don't know if there's a distinction there, if you want to make a distinction there. She was in it. There was astrology and astronomy. I'm not talking about astronomy. That There was astronomy in it, but that's not a big deal. I mean, you know, whatever. There was astrology in it. Um, they also had the had the theme of as above, so below, and the, the hermetic, hermetic principle we were talking about. It was there, too. You know, when she goes to, to get the, the thing of Trident, if you guys have ever seen it, um, it does the, the, the diamonds or whatever the heck they were, uh, mirrored what was in the heavens. You know, it's little things like that. Well, is that really, you know, and they'll kind of like do it in like low-key things. But once you know about the cult, you, you see it there all the time. Um, and uh, besides that, there were other occultic themes that I just don't even want to mention. I mean, it's why beat it into the, whore, into, the, into the ground. But what I'm saying by bringing that movie up is, I'm not saying, hey, don't watch this movie. I'm not saying that. I, I personally don't feel comfortable with watching it. But I'm not telling you guys not to watch it. I mean, you guys are going to have to come to your own conclusion through what the scripture says and through, if, you, if need be, fasting and prayer. You know what I mean? I'm not going to try and... Which one? What one what? Which one movie? Which movie is it? Pirates of the Caribbean. Oh, okay. uh, I'm not gonna try and give you a conscience. I'm not gonna try and force my conscience upon you. Okay, I'm just. My point in this is to show that the cult really is in a lot of things in our culture, and and you know people like to pretend like like the American culture is a Christian culture. It's very much so not a Christian culture. There, it means the there's just the cult in everything. And, I mean, it's everywhere around us, and, and, you know, people pretend like it's normal, and it's just there anyways. Um, okay, uh, Amulets and Charms. Uh, these are kind of died out in our culture, but they are still a thing. Um, uh, what are they called? Uh, the Native American things. Um, Dreamcatchers dream can, be, can be considered one of these. Um, different things like that. But anyways... Uh, it's an object with power to protect the owner from evil, which is funny because we don't need an object to protect us from evil. But yet, the people in the cult admit that there is evil. They just have these charms that will protect them from evil. But 
Hmm. Oftentimes, the charms of the, like when Carrie was here, he was talking about how when he's going to the different uh, Hindu villages in, in, in India, how you know they'll have these different you know uh, idols and charms and stuff hanging up, and they'll give their life over to God and they'll say, well, that has to go too. You know, you, you can't you can't honestly be praying for the demon to be cast out of your daughter when that's still in your house, and they'll go out and they'll burn it, and then voila. The demon will come out of their child. It's like, wow, I didn't see that one coming. You know what I mean? And you can't deny these things. I mean, it's just the way it is. Um, using one allies oneself with the demonic. If you use a charm for protection, you're, you're, you know, and I was walking in Thule, and I saw a Catholic house. You can tell because they have, like, the, the statues and stuff of uh, St. Uh, Francis or whatever. Uh, anyways, and in every single window, they had a dream catcher. Every single window. See what I mean? It's like... Well, you don't need that if you've got the blood of Christ, right? I mean, I'm not the only one who's who's seeing this this conundrum here, right? Um, Isn't that crazy? Right? Um, and also, I want to bring this up again. I mean, I can't really pound this into the ground enough. It's unnecessary because of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't even matter if it had any power, hypothetically or not, because we it's unnecessary. So that takes us to auras. Now, auras is basically. Everybody has this field of energy that's around them. It's real big in Hinduism and New Age. Um, and, you know, you can tell a lot from somebody's aura, or you can tell bad things that are happening, or you can tap into it to, to kind of unite yourself with the oneness of the world or whatever. Now, remember, oh, that has a lot to do with vibes, you know, getting in, in sync with the vibes of the universe. So, as far as do they exist, there's, excuse me, there's these there's these photos that they've, that they've created that show color fields around people. But A, it hasn't been proven that, that it's a good method of, you know, whether scientific, I guess you could say. It, it hasn't had proper study on it, so we don't know if those are legitimate photos or not. But then there's also there's, there's a thing about it could just be um, body electricity, you know, because we, we have electricity. That, you know, human bodies kind of, you know, conductors of electricity and whatnot, <laughs> you know, all that stuff. Uh, and, you know, our bodies really are basically like a big computer. Um, did I miss something there? Okay. Um, and so there, there is that, but then once again, we're unsure if these are actually legitimate photos or not because you can only use this one special tool, and they've never actually done any validation on that one special tool. So it's like, but nevertheless, a lot of Christians uh, believe in this too. Um, I kind of see it as not really relevant. Um, even if they do exist, I don't really see why that's relevant. But um, I wouldn't get too sidetracked on seeking after auras, just my own, hmm. you know, um, demonic communication. Um, this is done through many different ways. One way is automatic writing. Now that's basically you go into a trance, and a demon will write with your hand while you're in this trance, and you know give you secret messages and stuff. Um, and they'll use different means too. They won't just use automatic writing. They'll use things like where you um, have a tape recorder, and they'll you know speak under the tape recorder and that kind of stuff, and you play it back and hear them. Um, you know they'll they'll use a lot of different things. Yoga is another way. Um, I, I talked about this a lot, how people think that it's just simply stretches, but it's not simply stretches. Those yoga yoga, yoga stretches were actually designed by a Hindu uh, for the purpose of opening up the chakras so you can communicate with the su Supreme Spirit, obviously not God, um, and enhance, you know, enhance the flow of the energy. And those, des those stretches were specifically designed with the chakras in mind. Hindu philosophy all over, you know. And so do I think stretches are wrong? No, but you can't separate yoga from the occult. It's just not possible. So when I see Christians doing the yoga, I think, eh. <laughs> you know, I, even if it is hypothetically possible to separate yoga from the different me media, uh, meditation things that go along with it, I just don't think that that's an area that we need to be playing with. You know, I just... But then again, you know, I don't know. Uh, there is channeling. That's where a spirit talks and acts through the individual. Um, it actually is on another child show that we're going to talk about in a minute. Um, and crystals, you know, they have these 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 special crystals that you can carry on you, and they can be used for different things, healings and enlightenment and all kinds of different things. And a crystal can be programmed, you know, to help you tune into the energy of the en en energy of the atmosphere or world or universe or whichever. Um, and uh, so then you get these special crystals, and, and really what it is is it's rock, you know, mineral rocks. You know, you can find them in a cave, you know, whatever. And, you know, for whatever reason, they think that it has a special power to it, you know. Um, then there's crystal balls, which I'm sure all of you are very familiar with. It's used, used just in a form of, of uh, channeling or in seances or in um, um, astrology, too. I mean, it's really used in a lot of different things, fortune-telling. Um, 
dowsing. There's a lot of different dowsing. Um, there's a dowsing rod like to find water. There are dowsing things to find different things. Not all of them are, are sticks. There are, you know, that is a form, which we probably are very familiar with out here. There's a lot of people, you know, oh, looking for wells and uh, stuff. My great grandma actually was very prominent around here for water witching. Yeah, water witching. Oh, I'm sorry. That's another term for water for dowsing for water. Water witching. I forgot to mention that. Yeah, you were telling me about that. <laughs> and we have the maple tree growing. Uh, anyways, um, and yeah, so dowsing is really used for a lot of different things. Water, I think, is the most common that you most people know about. But you know. Uh, tapping into secret energy uh, is real common, um, or uh, connecting with the energy of the universe, or emptying your mind to find the energy, or whatever. We know that all these different terms, however they're defined, is the demonic power. It's Satan's power. Um, then there's electronic voice phenomena. This is what I mentioned before, where, where, you can, where they'll speak onto a tape recorder, that kind of stuff. Uh, psychometry, secret knowledge attained by touching objects, going to places. So basically, I die, right? And so the person will touch my controller, or my shirt, or whatever, and will be able to tell something about where I was, or, you know, whatever. Well, we know that the thing doesn't actually give any knowledge. <laughs> the demon tells them, and because they want to believe it's associated with the object well then that's what the demon does because remember a demon will most likely not try and change your change your beliefs as long as it's not scriptural you know like for instance about jesus they won't say necessarily that jesus was not christ they'll just say he was a christ he was a good person but there are other christ too there's buddha and you know because they're not interested in making you believe that there is no such thing as a, a christ just that jesus isn't the only way to salvation because if if you give up jesus hey the ba battle's won it doesn't matter where your theology lies beyond that you know whatever as long as they don't believe in Jesus for their salvation, we got this thing covered, you know? Uh, so, uh, Satan is not equal with God, though. Obviously, I feel like that always needs to be mentioned with every, whenever you're talking about the cult. Um, Satan is in no way equal with God. Satan is a fallen angel. God is God. Jesus is God. Not Satan's brother. <laughs> and no way are they even on related platforms. Right. <laughs> you know, we just, no. Um, anyways, uh, so you can see the the demons kind of communicate through a lot of different uh, means. Uh, and I'm trying to blow through these last ones because, you know, I mean, they're just kind of obvious, and then we're going to look at them when we get to witchcraft and that kind of stuff anyways. Um, basically, magic in its... Mo now, there are different kinds of magic. If you ever seen magic spelt with a K, it's because it was kind of reinvented um, in the early 1900s. We'll talk about that with Satanism. Um, spells are occult tools used to control the supernatural power. That's... Basically, the real easy definition. Um, obviously, we know that the power is from Satan. God doesn't work that work this way. He doesn't work on manipulation of things through different rituals. In fact, even prayer, if you notice, is not manipulating of God or the environment. It's an appeal to God, and God answers or he does not answer. You know, it's no magic spell there. But a lot of times, people treat prayers like they are a magical spell. If you say good things, it brings about positive things. If you say bad things, it brings... But Proverbs says that... A curse that do, that doesn't isn't warranted. It doesn't it doesn't impact. It doesn't. Uh, it's like it's like a bird that doesn't land. You know, if somebody speaks a curse on you and it doesn't, it's not warranted. It's, you don't have to worry about it. You know what I mean? Um, now, the, he does say that there are some times where a curse will take hold. For instance, if you oppress the poor person and the poor person cries out to God, then God will put a curse on you. Mm -hmm. So there is there is there are curses do definitely exist, but. You know, we do need to make sure that we understand the correct idea of it. Now, let's say, for instance, we're serving the community and witches try and put hexes on us. We don't have to worry about it because we're covered by, by God, and it's, you know, we don't have to worry about it. But let's say, for instance, we're not serving God. We're pretending to serve God, but we're not really serving him because our hearts line into it. We just do all the right things so that God will accept us by our works. And then a, and then a witch put, puts hex on us. Well, then you have something to be concerned about <laughs> because you're not covered by the blood of the Lamb. <laughs> so obviously... Um, <clears throat> Many try to obtain the Holy Spirit with impure motives or through magical means. In fact, you even see this in the book of Acts. There's a sorcerer, I think Simon was his name. And, uh, you know, he's like, hey, how can I buy this from you? And he's like, okay, let's calm down there. This is the Holy Spirit. You can't buy it. You know, this is very wicked what you've done. And he's like, okay, my bad. Please enter, Please pray for me. <laughs> I realize what I've done. My bad. <laughs> um, often confused with, um, with religion, yes, uh, prayers are obviously relate to chance. Um... So there is that, you know, and and I'm not talking about um, necessarily repeating a prayer over and over again. Although sometimes satanic, for instance, Satanism will do things, Christian things, but repeat them backwards. 
So that is a thing. But I'm more talking about where, like, um, they'll try to... Pastor talked about this last Sunday. Uh, me, vain repetition, right? Mm -hmm. That's kind of what I'm talking about here. Um, you know, kind of repeating words as though the words themselves have power rather than realizing that the prayer is not powerful. The God who answers the prayer is powerful. Does that make sense? Now, if you read in James, he says, you know, about how prayer is... It, it, it does something amazing because we pray to God. You know, at the end of the book, there I, I'm paraphrasing. Obviously, that's because I can't remember the exact thing. You know, if you if you if you want me to look it up, it's in James, uh, chapter five. But uh, anyways, um, and then uh, power is confused with the Holy Spirit, and sometimes on purpose, sometimes on accident. The Pharisees did this when it was absolutely positive that it was by the working of God that He was doing these things, and they still decided to attribute it to Satan. And Jesus stops and says, "Okay, time out." Anything you say and do will be forgiven you, except for blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That's something you guys need to absolutely not know. It's not going to be forgiven now or in the next life. So what did he say was blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? Where you attribute something that is of Satan to the Holy Spirit, or when you attribute something of the Holy Spirit to, <laughs> to Satan. God really doesn't like his holy name profaned. I found that one out, you know, just from reading the Bible there. Uh, but you can see how oftentimes with the magical things, you know, things are... are, are, are it presents itself as religion. And you'll see when we look at witchcraft here in a couple weeks, you know, witchcraft doesn't define itself as a religion. It defines itself as a practice. So you can claim to be of a religion like Christian and yet still practice witchcraft and, to sing, and say, oh, hey, that's okay, because it's not a religion, even though it is, though, but whatever. We'll look at that when we get to that. Um, any questions on magic? Okay, cool. Um, okay. So that takes us to Christian divination and divination. Um, numerology, the idea that different numbers are added up to mean different things. Um, and you can find secret hidden meanings by counting the numbers up of names. Or even, you know, um, names themselves will relate to things. And numbers are given different meanings. And so these different numbers will add up to other things. And so there is in the Bible some slight truth to some numbers are symbolic and that kind of stuff. Daniel's 70 weeks, for instance. Um, or in the book of Genesis where it's talking about um, the spread of people. And it says very specifically 70 nations because that's the idea of completeness, you know. Or uh, the 12 tribes of Israel. Or the seven days of creation, you know, th those kinds of things. And so there is, you know, some idea to this, but divination takes it past that. It's past what the Bible is intending to its original audience. And it's instead the secret meaning that I've attributed to these numbers hundreds of years later you know what I mean? Like, what's the significance of the seven days? The significance of the seven days is the idea of complete. That God made the earth in seven days. So Israel was to form their calendar like this, with the seventh day being the Sabbath, because that's how God orchestrated it. Okay. So then 70 would be an extension of seven, the idea of completeness, right? It's just ten times more. There's, there's that. If you notice in one of the Gospels, it says that 70 were sent out, and the other one it says 72. Because the other one is using the rounding of 70 for the idea of completeness, whereas the other one is using the exact how many were actually there. It's not rounding. It's giving the actual number. There were 72. See what I mean? Um, or 12s, which symbolize the 12 tribes of Israel. Jesus had 12 apostles. You see what I mean? Like You see the same things going on and on, but it's not in the same way as divination uses it. So I hope that that kind of makes that clear. Uh, signs. Even Christians oftentimes look for signs, you know. Hey, if this happens today, that will mean that you want me to do this. Or if this happens, I'll mean this. You know, and, and they take for this Gideon, uh, where he lays the fleece down and it's wet and the ground's dry, or vice versa. He does two different tests. And they say, oh, well, this is my proof text. But the thing is, the Bible isn't condoning what he says. It's just listing that that's what he did. It says, it says a lot of things that people did that is not condoning. People, uh, for instance, uh, had multiple wives back then. I mean, it's not saying, hey, go out and do the same. It just said, hey, this is what they did. See what I mean? Like, there, there's, a, there's something there that needs to be distinguished. So, yes, God did answer him in that way. But, see, Gideon never got past the occult. He burned up his father's altar just like God told him to. But then, after he won his great victory, he set up his own altar to his own idol. See what I mean? He never got past the occult. God was trying to show him something, and he used where Gideon was at, that mystical sign, but Gideon was supposed to have taken that and sought after God and grown spiritually. But instead, he said, no, this is the way that God will always speak to me, so I'm going to establish this idol. And then all Israel 
came to that idol and worshipped there. If you're interested in that story, it's in the book of Judges. Um, hidden messages. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I mean, does, do I even need to elaborate on this one, man? You know, hey, uh, I woke up and got on Facebook and somebody said Tuesday. That means on Tuesday I'm going to be given this great gift. You know what I mean? It's like, whoa, okay, let's calm down there, friends. <laughs> Uh, palmistry. That's I mean that's obviously where they read your palms to get the future tea leaf reading. When you're when you're drinking loose leaf tea, it'll always leave uh, you know tea at the bottom of your cup. However, it lands on the bottom of the cup once you finish your tea will you know depend on on that kind of stuff. Uh, Ouija boards, which actually you will not get the name for this. Okay, it comes from we and ja. Two different uh, uh, <laughs> words, I think, in French and German. I think uh, which means yes. So the, it literally means yes yes board. <laughs> uh, don't ask me why they named it such a stupid name. I don't know. Um, it was marketed as harmless. Uh, I think it was invented in Pennsylvania, if I remember correctly. Um, and it was originally uh, marketed as a child's toy. You know, now it's got. It's recently gotten a lot of publicity. In fact, there's a movie that came out a couple years ago called Ouija. Um, but you know, my sister's calling me. Sorry. <laughs> No, it's just, you know, I'm trying to finish this up. <laughs> um, demons do make contacts through it, and people, vice versa, will try to contact demons through it. Um, you know, and a lot of people don't know that it is actually demonic. You know, I, I'm, I'm continually surprised when I say, you know, hey, why do you have that in the house? And they say, oh, yeah, it's nothing wrong, it's just a game. It's like, well, okay, well, that's one view of thinking about it. So the question always comes up, why burn the things? When, you're, when, when you get out of the cult and you want to get rid of them, why burn it? Why not throw it, just throw it away? Well, biblically, the idea of burning is always um, given for the idea of complete destruction. Right. Okay? It's the idea of – now, these aren't the only ways that, that, that bring about complete destruction, but oftentimes in the Bible it's used for the idea of complete destruction. So when you get out of the cult and you burn it, it's symbolizing to God, I'm completely done with this. It's a way of renouncing Satan. It's a way of, of renouncing Satan for you and your household. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You take this stuff out and burn it. Um, can you achieve the same thing through just throwing the things away? You can, um, but in my in my experience, it seems like people get quicker spiritual relief from demonic activity when they burn it than when they throw it away. My own experience. Um, you can still get freedom if you've thrown it away rather than burning it. I'm not saying you know God won't do that, but you know um, usually some usually some people won't get closure until they either verbally renounce Satan, Satan I renounce you and you work. Or if they uh, do it by actions, like for instance, burning. Goodness sakes, did somebody die? Ooh, I hope somebody didn't actually die. Uh, That's gonna be terrible. <laughs> Anyways, um, maybe Gracie did something. Uh, no, Deborah lives in Texas. She, Gra Gracie would have just called me, or she would have called you and told you to tell me. <laughs> um, and also to prevent other people from using it. Whenever you get out of the cult, you don't want other people to get a and get a hold of you. You don't take it to the thrift store, for instance. You get rid of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know. Um, and also, it's to ensure you don't return to it. If you throw it out, there's always a chance that you can go back to it. That you can go back to it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And there's always that chance. Um, and also to show its lack of worth. When you burn something, it's the ultimate way of saying this doesn't it has no value. Right. It's a it's a it's a public declaration. It's just like it's just like being baptized. It's a public declaration of what's happened spiritually. You know what I mean? Um, where where you're you're just saying this is who I am. And so when you burn something, you're, at, you're saying, this has no value to me whatsoever. Um, seances, we've looked at so much, I don't even really see the need to beat this one too much. Meetings to contact the dead, a cult is overemphasis on death and darkness. That is very much a theme in all the things of the cult. They will always overemphasize death and darkness. Um, I've never heard of this. Uh, seances where people gather together. Uh, oh, you weren't here when we mentioned it. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, uh, people gather together, usually in a circle. Um, oftentimes, they light candles and try to contact dead, the dead oh, people. Oh, okay, okay. So, um, not personal. And if you <laughs> if you talk to people in the seance, they, you know, the demon that portrays itself, they all. They always will agree against Christianity. They'll get they'll get different details. You know, like hey, somebody will supposedly die and come back and say there was no heaven or hell. It's just you know peace and happiness. Or somebody else will say, well, Jesus was just a Christ. He wasn't the only way. Or it's, you know another person will say, uh, you know, hey, Jesus wasn't the Christ. You know, whatever. They'll all say the same thing that Christianity is not true, but they'll say it. In, you know, they'll all say different things by not agreeing with. Well, is there an afterlife or isn't there? You know what I mean? They'll say these different things, but according to who's the, who the audience is. Um, also, there's no reason to contact them. You don't need secret knowledge from them. And 
Although it's hard to say goodbye to people once they've gone, that's a part of life. Life is full of death. In fact, if you remember the movie Christmas or the book Christmas Carol, um, you know one of the things that he says is life is filled with meetings and partings, and that's just the way it, the way it is. And it's part of the curse from from the fall from Eden, from the Garden of Eden in, in Genesis, and it's just something that is unpleasant. But it's something that we have to carry until it's our turn to go to heaven. And that's hard for us. And so a lot of times, rather than facing that, we try and resolve the issue by contacting the dead to kind of get closure. But remember that you, no matter how much it hurts, you can always pray to God and he will always be there to comfort you. Maybe not the first time you pray because, you know, sometimes we just throw out random rushed prayers and then if God doesn't instantly answer, we just, you know, move on. But the thing is, sometimes through that perseverance of going to the Lord in prayer, we reach a fuller completeness and comfort than we could have any other way. You know what I mean? So, anyways, um, this world is the worst thing we will ever experience. It only gets better from here as a Christian. Whereas people go to hell, this is the best thing they're going to experience. Remember that, you know, this is something that, that no matter how hard life is, this is as hard as it's ever going to be. Remember that. Um, preaching Christ is too narrow. Bible is not true. De uh, dedication to Christ is pointless. You know, these same kind of things. Um, life after death consists of work to go higher. There is no devil, that kind of stuff. These are all things that, that, that uh, the cult will always say. Um, but one thing that, that uh, the cult... This is a half-truth. Because I just told you about how um, in Christianity this world is legitimately the worst thing we'll ever have, ever have to endure. But in the cult, they'll say that same thing too. But what they'll say is you don't need to come to salvation. You know, you just need to join us in death. You know, because in death you'll find that new life. Whereas we partake of a spiritual death, we don't actually kill ourselves. Right. But the cult goes to the other extreme, and instead of being reborn spiritually, they die physically. Which negates the opportunity for salvation. So, um, half truths, half truths, things that seem true. Um, spirit guides I already said this. Oftentimes portrayed as guardian angels, invisible helpers, mischievous spirits. Really, just whoever you're talking to are different. Contacted through meditation, most often. Um, astral projection, that kind of stuff. They're all kind of contacted through similar methods. Um, they teach us. They're always available for us. Uh, you know that kind of idea. Uh, there, and there's even the teaching that they're drawn to us. Like, uh, if you're familiar with Native American beliefs, uh, the dream catcher is kind of the idea that there's these these bad dreams and good dreams, and I'll just kind of float in there, you know. And, and what a dream catcher does is it kind of attracts all of them, and it just filters them out. And the good ones will filter down to us, and the bad ones will just be caught in the net, you know, that kind of idea. And so there's kind of that same idea with with, with spirit guides, you know. There's they're they're drawn to us. Um, uh, destructive demons masquerading in darkness as, as a good angel. I mean, this is just, we've talked about this, so I really don't want to drag this out too much. Tarot cards, it's another form of fortune telling. Cards used to tell the future. I, I went through this a couple weeks ago, too. I mean, it's really a basic idea. You know, you, you pull the cards, and the different cards mean different things. There's two different, two different suits. There's a major arcana or something like that, and then there's minor ones, and they relate to different aspects of your life, and then combined with other things, they mean different things. It's basically like astrology. You know, it just uses cards instead of stars. Um, possibly adapted from a card game from the 1400s. We don't really know the origins from tarot cards. Whatever its origin, it's been so far removed from it that we just don't even know. You know, um, Some things that is associated with the Kabbalah tree of life, um, I kind of find that very unlikely because there's really no proof for that. Um, but we talked about Kabbalah a few weeks ago. It's basically uh, Jewish mysticism. Mysticism. Um, and I mentioned this, the cult. Okay, so now... We're past through all that. Any questions on that? Okay, now let's look at uh, the cult in the media. And I'm trying to finish this up because I really don't want to drag this out for three weeks, and I'm almost mm -hmm. to the end. You know, I, uh, 28 of 34. The last one is the, is the question. These other ones just go real fast. Um, the uh, as I said, the cult is really throughout the media around us. Um, I just picked a few examples. Um, there's a, a software company that creates video games called ID, and this is the reason that they, that they named their, their company ID. The one of the three divisions of the psyche completely unconscious and is a source of psychic energy. So that seems like a bad reason to name your, your thing that. Yu-Gi-Oh! Is, is, I don't think it's a big deal anymore, but it was you know back when I was a kid. Um, uh, basically, it's a boy with magical powers who channels an ancient Egyptian wise man. So we have channeling. That's great to teach our kids. Right. Avatar The Last Airbender, I mentioned this. A Hindu deity reborn and reincarnated you know, countless times. Uh, possesses psychic power. I mean, we've gone over that. The Da Vinci Code. There's secret truths that are hidden by the church. You know, The church doesn't want you to know. 
um, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, real fast just going through these things because it's just to show you. Uh, a, a game called Elder, Elder Scrolls, uh, a lot of fantasy books and, and games and stuff. Uh, the use of magic, uh, uh, secret, you know, secret rituals and spells and that kind of stuff. I mentioned that game that I played. Um, um, Dishonored. What? Dishonored. Dishonored, yes. Yes. Thank you, yes. Uh, where you wear charms and that kind of stuff, and they give you secret powers, and you know, uh, you have psychic powers like teleportation, that kind of stuff that we talked about. Um, there was a book that came out a few years ago, probably 2002 or something like that, called The Secret, and basically it's becoming one with the universe. Um, there's labyrinths. You see this in a lot of cult occultic things, the idea that in your mind you go through this labyrinth, and it's a visualization tool, and you, once you reach the center, you can find that oneness, and you can, then you can come back out of the myth, uh, labyrinth, and then you know, relay that to other people, you know, to get the secret knowledge. And the occult is always about the secret knowledge. Like we mentioned where the where it comes from in the Latin, the occultus, you know. Um, so this is the part that I actually wanted to focus on. Um, Genesis 40, verse 8. I'm sorry I'm going late. If anybody needs to go, I totally understand. Um, I will be posting this online if, if you know, um, so for you guys to watch later if you want. Um, then they said to him, "We have had a dream, and there is no no one to interpret it. Interpret it." Now this they're talking to Joseph. Then Joseph said to them, "Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell it to me, please." Exodus 22:18. I already mentioned this. This is where he says, you know, "Put a sorcerer to death." Um, you can turn there if you want, but I'm not going to turn there. Leviticus 19. You know, we don't have to worry about interpretations of dreams and whatnot because we don't have to go to some witch to get the interpretation. We have to go online for the secret hidden meanings and stuff because God is the one who, who, if there is anything to our dream, can interpret it for us. Uh, but obviously, the more when you get involved with the cult, you're going to have weird dreams and demonic dreams and those kinds of things, and they're not going to have a meaning. It's just going to be the dem demonic uh, playing playing. Uh, with your mind. Leviticus 19.26 says, um, 2.31, uh, You shall not eat anything with the blood, nor practice divination or soothsaying. You shall not round off the side uh, growth of your uh, um, side growth of your heads, nor harm the edges of your beard. Now, this is act this was actually a, a practice that they used in divination. Um, now, it's okay to cut the edges of your beard nowadays because it's not used in the practice of I idolatry. Okay? Um, you shall not make any cuts in your body for the dead, nor make any tattoo marks on yourselves. Now, the word here translated could be translated tattoo, or it could be also translated as, as uh, uh, cutting yourself. Um, it's not really clear, but what is clear is that this was another occultic practice. This is not a timeless principle. You know, uh, Christians nowadays who get, who get tattoos is not the end of the world. You know, it, it's whatever. It's, it's not that thing. A, we're not held to the law, and B, that part of the law is, is focused on – that's – okay, let me say it differently. The cult is – I mean the law is broken up into two kinds of commands basically. There's principles, which are timeless, and then there's applications that were specific to their culture. Right. The Bible says do not worship any other gods. That's a principle. That's always true. But then it gave specific applications of how not, how not to uh, serve any other gods by trimming the edges of your beard because that was a common practice. For the for, divin for for the cult, and by cutting yourselves through tattoos and other different things. In fact, uh, in in Egypt, there was recently a body that was excavated of a slave who had uh, uh, tattoos, which show exactly what the tattoos were used for back then. It was uh, different reliefs of the gods and goddesses, and different rituals and that kind of stuff. That's what tattoos were. This idea that, that is nowadays tattoos for just you know either entertainment or for marking scripture on your body. That's a new idea. You know, um, and it's important to notice also that the Bible says not to get tattoos in one part of the Old Testament law. And when Paul wrote uh, the city of Philippi, which was a very strong, um, it had a lot of veterans from, from from the Roman army. A lot of veterans. In fact, there was a huge group of people that lived there. Roman s s soldiers got tattoos when they joined the legion. And you know he never mentions anything about them being wrong or evil or anything like that because it wasn't part of, 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 of idol worship. You know what I mean? And so I think that needs to be kept in, 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 in perspective. In Leviticus, that's what the people of Canaan were doing in their idol worship. But nowadays, tattoos aren't used that much for idol worship. In, in some areas of the world, they are like Africa. That's absolutely still a thing. Um, some places of the Caribbean, that kind of stuff. But uh, remember, the idea here is not to worship any other gods besides God. 
the principle there. Okay, so why are you getting that the tattoo? For worship of yourself, or for an idol, or for worship of God? For instance, I don't think that it's wrong to get a verse, for instance, tattooed on your body. See, I mean, like the Bible even talks about how um, you know His law will be imprinted on our hearts. You know, and there's the idea of it being stamped. You know, and I don't really see why that's wrong, but some Christians nowadays really get bent out of shape about this. And so I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings. I'm just saying there's really no reason to pinpoint that and then say, well, what about the edges of your beard? I mean, if you're going to ignore the context there, you might as well stop shaving your beard, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're going to ignore the context anyways, I mean, you, you, remember, you can make the Bible say whatever you want. People use the Bible to validate slavery hundreds of years ago. So um, Deuteronomy 13, I'm not going to read 18 because we already read that uh, that one to you, but uh, 13, 1 through 3. In fact, I'm not going to read that one to you either. It's where he says that if somebody says that something's going to happen and it does, but then they say, hey, let's go worship other gods, even though what they said did come true, don't listen to them. I, the Lord your God, am testing you to see if you're going to serve me or not. And that's uh, Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 3, if you want to read that. Uh, Isaiah 8, 19 through 20. Um, Isaiah really has a lot to say about divination, too. Um, If I can turn to it. Chuck, would you mind turning to Isaiah 47, 13 through 15 on your phone? Isaiah 8, 19 through 20 says, um, When they say to you, consult the mediums and the spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people consult their God? Should they consult the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimony, I'm sorry, to the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because they have no, have no dawn. And I'll stop reading there. Um, and then uh, Jeremiah 10. And I'm trying to show you how it's really throughout the whole Bible. It's not something that we, you can really laugh off. It's something that obviously is very um, much so not approved by God. Go ahead and read yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> you are worn out with your many consultations, so let the astrologers stand and save you, those who observe the stars, those who predict monthly what will happen to you. Look, they are like stubble, fire burns them. They cannot rescue themselves from the power of the flame. This is not a coal for warming themselves or a fire to set beside. This is what they are to you, those who have wearied you and have traded with you from your youth. Each wanders on his own way. No one can save you. Have wearied you. That, just, that gets me every time. I, it blows my mind. What he just said is they have literally wearied themselves out by seeking out the astrologers. Wow, that's a big statement. Anyways, Jeremiah 10, 2 through 3. Thus says the Lord, do not learn the way of the nations and do not let uh, do not be terrified by the signs of the heavens like some so-called Christians were doing the, with the red moons. Remember that? They were just causing mass, mass panic. Um, do not be terrified by the signs of the heavens, although the nations are terrified by them. For the customs of the people are delusion. Because it is wood cut from uh, the forest, the work of the hand of a craftsman with a cutting tool. He's talking about the idol there. And then in Ezekiel 13, and this will be the last verse that we turn to about this, because I think you kind of see what the emphasis of the scripture. Exodus 13, 20 through 21, um, which says, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against your magic bands by which you hunt lives. Um, hunt lives. There is birds, and I will tear them from your arms. Um, so there he says about the magic bands. Um, this could be like a charm, like we talked about charms or a fetish, or it could be um, some kind of a magical um, incantation. I, I'm, I'm unsure. And I will let them go, even those lives uh, whom you hunt as birds. And I will also tear off your veils and deliver my people from your hands, and they will no longer be in your hands to be hunted, and you will know that I am the Lord. The cult burrows in the church's failure. Every time that the church has a failure, the cult is very quick to snatch it up. Um, if you look back over the over the mistakes that the church has made in the past hundred years, you'll find that there's the cult filling in the void, like they're like vultures. Uh, much of the cult has gotten into the church as well. We talked about this at the beginning of the lesson tonight, uh, and we are commanded not to take part. It's not something that if you don't want to take part, we're commanded very specifically. Um, and also, I want to say this: our witness as Christians will be cut short, and our power in the Holy Spirit will be cut short, because the Holy Spirit doesn't he doesn't do competition. You know what I mean? If you want to seek the occult, he'll just kind of withdraw. He doesn't do the whole competition thing. He has control over the situation. You can either submit to that, or you can fight him on it. But you can't do both. 
some areas have to be left to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Now, what I mean by that is when, when you're watching movies, where's the line in media? What movies are you going to not watch? I can't answer that question for you. What kind of music are you going to... What, what video games are you going to abstain from? I can't answer that from you. And I think it really applies to what Paul said that, you know, where, you, where your conscience is. If you think you shouldn't, then don't. If it's very specific that the Bible condemns it, then don't. But ultimately, you have to make the decision yourself. Because I can't, and this is something that the last generation of Christians tried to do, I can't condemn you for something and try to make you feel guilty to try and get you to change. I have to let the Holy Spirit do his work in you, and you have to let the Holy Spirit do, do his work in you. See what I mean? And sometimes that's uncomfortable. Some movies I really liked. I really liked the movie The Mummy. Uh, but I felt like it bore it – not the new one. Oh, my gosh, not the new one. Let, let me just go – I'm talking about the one with Brendan Fraser. <laughs> that, Tom Cruise, oh, my gosh, I just – oh, I hate him. Worst actor in the history of the world, but he keeps getting in movies. I'm like, stop putting him in movies. <laughs> Anyways, um, I'm talking about the good mummy, you know, but I, I, I felt I felt con convicted about it, so I got rid of it. You know what I mean? And, and I, I used to own all the Pirates of the Caribbean movies. Now I only have the first one because I just felt like they got really weird and they satanic really and weird. witchcraft. And I just said, I'm, I'm done with this. Uh, so you have to just kind of, where's the cutoff for study? How, how, when you're studying the things of the occult to become more able to contradict them or to, you know, fight against them spiritually, where's the line that you cut off? Because you don't want to get too immersed in it. Because, like Paul said, hey, don't don't be too wise, in, in, you know, in these things. Be children in the ways of in sin, okay? But but be spiritually mature in, in your in your thinking here, you know. So there is that line there, and you kind of have to just figure it out for yourself. You know, I've seen a lot of people who studied the the cults, like Jehovah's Witness, for instance, to you know be more equipped, and then they ended up falling to it. You know, so it's like you're gonna have to find out where that line is, and wherever wherever the Holy Spirit sets, take your stand there. See what I mean? Don't you go out and decide. Let the Holy Spirit tell you and take your stand there. I've taken my stand on astrology and horoscopes because that's where the Holy Spirit, Spirit laid it down at, and I, that's where I came to. See what I mean? You all have to be fully convinced in your mind that you're doing what God has told you instead of what you want to. That's just the way it is. Um, here's here's a question that, that you know that's unanswered. Harry Potter was written by someone who claims to be a Christian, but it has a lot of witchcraft themes. And like I said, with witchcraft, it's not actually considered a religion by them. By them, they don't consider themselves a religion, and so they can be part of any religion that they want, and it's considered a practice, quote unquote practice. Okay, well, it's still condemned in the Bible, but whatever. Um, <laughs> so you, you have that. Is it wrong or is it not wrong? Well, so I mean, you, you kind of have to, I guess, just take a step back and take a look. Miracles. Uh, there are many miracles who, who claim to be from God, and you have to ask a series of questions. Uh, what is exalted? What is getting the spotlight? A person, or is it God? Or, you know, like weeping icons, you know, like a, a painting that, that weeps or whatever. Uh, statues that, 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 that weep or whatever. You know, things like that. You, you see them every once in a while come up. And, oh, it's a miracle. Well, is it a miracle, or is it the satanic power? Because what I see happen when that stuff happens is they take those items that the demonic have used, and they enshrine them. And then it's like a thing of worship, where you're worshiping the thing. What was benefited by that by that statue crying? So I mean, there was no benefit to the people. Nobody was healed. Nobody was um, nobody was brought to salvation. Um, does it agree with the biblical message? Is it condemned by Scripture? If you think you are the exception to the rule, you will become your own god, and God will no longer be your, your authority. You can't see yourself as an exception to the rule. You know, hey, that's for everybody else, but I'm the, you know, I'm, I'm so spiritual, I don't need that. Uh, stay in prayer and the word, fellowship and absence of evil. I mean, these are just things that, that that's like the essence of, of Christianity. Stay in prayer, stay in the word, stay in fellowship with other Christians, and abstain from evil. I mean, that's just something that you need to grow. And then I have a note here. Whatever Satan's power can do, the Holy Spirit is our source of power. Definitely not ourselves. We do not get the power from ourselves or from another energy that we tap into. It's a difficult time to be a Christian. Absolutely, we are not assaulted by persecution, but by compromise. The American church's greatest struggle will not be being persecuted physically overall. In more recent years, you know, that's gone up a little bit, but that's really not going to be our thing. Our problem is going to be not being apathetic towards the message of the gospel. Taking it with joy and spreading it rather than enjoying the material things so much. Um, we are called to wage war, not enjoy the demonic. And that's a hard thing because the demonic is oftentimes fun for people. 
you know, the Bible even says sin, sin is fun for a season. You know, but then when that season's over, <laughs> you know what I mean? And so a lot of times it seems like Christianity is boring or whatever. So in conclusion, uh, now that I've dra dragged this out till after 8.15, uh, sorry about that. Beware what you do and why. Know why you do what you do. Beware of, of what you believe. Um, do not be. In fact, there was a Christian who wrote a book. His name was Paul Little. He's dead now. Probably about 20 years now he's been dead. 20, 30, 30 years Anyways, his name was Paul Little, and he wrote two different books, Know Why You Believe and Know What You Believe, and really just a good starter for, for um, people who are just getting saved. Uh, well, even even for me, I mean, it's just great to, to read through and just kind of brush up on stuff. It's really a, it's, it's concise. They're both, you know, smallish books and simple things. That, you know, he doesn't get real deep into things. They're just hard to understand. He just lays it out nice and simple. Really a great book um, or books. Um, Do not be fooled by your experience. You know, oftentimes the demonic will, you'll see things, you'll feel things, and they won't be true. How is that true? To, how is that possible to see something and it not be true? I don't know. But that's just the way it's going to work. Um, you can't go by popularity. Well, everybody's doing it. Well, that doesn't make it right. Everybody in Canaan was doing that. God still said, because of these detestable things, I'm throwing them out. Um, or because of your emotions. Well, it feels right. It seems right. I didn't feel a check in my my holy and, and, and my spirit from the Holy Spirit, yeah, because he already told you in this. You know what I mean? Like, you can't let your emotions be a contradictor to the Bible. Uh, uh, subject the Bible to your emotions is, I guess, is what I'm saying. You you can't let them be at war. You have to submit yourself to what the Bible says, what God revealed to us. Um, and do not practice what God has forbidden. You do not choose the standard God does. So that takes us to the question of the week, and we are done. If there are any questions from the lesson, well, you weren't here, so I'm not going to ask you. <laughs> any questions? And remember, if you have a question that you don't feel comfortable with, the question box is there on the table. It's that ugly-looking box. You can put in any question that you have, and it will be answered anonymously if you, if you have any questions that you don't feel comfortable with. Anyways, the question of the week. As a Christian, do you have to get rid of everything that has a cult theme, such as the movie Nine? If you remember, I talked about the satanic themes in there with Age of Horrors. Uh, the movie Coraline, which has so many different things in it, it's hard to pinpoint, or, Sky, or games like Skyrim, or only certain things like Ouija boards. I mean, where do you draw the line? And that's really what I want to do is I want to open this up to um, has the Holy Spirit impressed something on your heart? And if not, um, have you sought his input on on your life? Um, and if not, you know, hey, what's holding back? And if you, if you have, you know, uh, I'd, I'd